All right, last day of spiritual gifts definitions. Let's get right into it with the gift of miracles. Now, interesting note about the gift of miracles. I actually recently discovered that I have this gift. So one thing that may be helpful to you is if I were just right here, right now, on camera, go ahead and demonstrate the gift of miracles for you. Uh, I'm making a joke, and that was probably obvious to you. I don't believe myself to have the gift of miracles. But even if I did, most Christians wouldn't believe that the gift of miracles functions the way that I was just talking about it. Meaning that most Christians don't believe that this would be an on-demand, at-will kind of a gift where I could just decide in any situation, at any time, I'm going to perform a miracle, at this kind of miracle, right now. Most people wouldn't see it that way. In the same way that we talked about the gift of healing, most Christians wouldn't believe today that there are healers or miracle workers. Rather, they would view these gifts as functioning uh, where the person through whom God did that miraculous work was simply a passive vessel, not an active agent. Uh, the apostles, as we talked about briefly, uh, they were active agents. Um, they had some discretion. They had some power to make decisions as to when these things were going to happen in a way that most people think was sort of reserved for those apostles at that time. We'll actually have a more in-depth conversation about just that point in next week's session. So certainly feel free to converse about it. Certainly feel free to submit new questions about it. But do know that we're going to get to questions that are probably already swirling around your mind with regard to the gift of miracles next week. But let it suffice for this session to say that most Christians would say that to the degree that God is going to use a person to perform a miracle, the person will have very little power over how that miracle happens, where that miracle happens, or who the recipient of that miracle would be. Most are going to say, no, God would, God would be the one who's presiding over all of the details of that, and any person who is a part of that process would simply be passively involved as a vessel, not actively involved as an agent who is uh, employing any discretion in the who, how, what, where, when, etc. So that's a little bit about the gift of miracles. Now, tongues and interpretation. We've touched on this uh, a little bit already, but tongues is the supernatural ability to speak a language that you don't actually know for the sake of evangelism. So if you're on the mission field with us at one of our mission trips and somebody walks up to you, they don't speak your language, you don't speak their language, but this thing comes over you and you begin to speak and you realize this person understands what I'm saying. I think that I'm sharing the gospel right now. This person becomes converted. That would be the gift of tongues. So supernatural ability to speak a known language for the sake of evangelism, despite the fact that the language that you're speaking is known to the other person, but not known to you in terms of academically. You wouldn't actually be able to speak that language in any other time, situation, scenario, etc. Now, the interpretation of tongues, simply enough, is the ability to translate a message that's given by someone who has the gift of tongues, or also understood as an ability to understand languages that you don't actually speak, such that maybe you could be helpful in a way, again, let's say mission field, you don't speak their language, they don't speak your language, but in a moment, God gives you the ability to understand what they're saying so that perhaps you can meet a need, save someone, you know, however we might understand that. So, tongues and interpretation of tongues. Next, we come to wisdom. Uh, wisdom, broadly speaking, is the proper application of knowledge. You've probably heard that definition. Uh, that's generally the way that Pastor Nathan and I have defined it. Wisdom is applied knowledge or the proper application of knowledge. Um, as an illustration, everyone knows, roughly speaking, how to be healthy, right? Uh, pass by the Krispy Kreme, don't pull in, okay? Uh, drink water and a fair amount of it, not soft drinks and lattes, right? Uh, exercise instead of sitting on the couch, 
most of us most of us know these things. Like it's not rocket science to know how to take good care of your body. Um, so the fact that the majority of our populace is unhealthy is not a breakdown in knowledge. It's a breakdown in the application of the knowledge that we have, right? And so maybe that's a simple way to understand it. But but then if if that's all wisdom is, why does it need to be a spiritual gift? You know, we may say that sounds more like... Uh, you need a life coaching session about doing the things that you know. I, I, I don't know that you need the Holy Spirit to empower you with the gift of wisdom. But it gets more complicated, doesn't it? Uh, because not all situations are that cut and dry, and not all knowledge is that easily applied. Uh, so let's put it in the context of the local church. You're trying to live faithfully and honor Jesus in the local church. I'm trying to live faithfully and honor Jesus in the local church. And, and, and there are some things that we know from scripture, but knowing some principles from scripture and being able to apply them wisely are not the same thing. So let's say you know some Bible verses about modesty, right? You know that we ought not be drawing attention to ourselves in the clothes that we wear. Uh, you know that clothes are intended to cover the body, not accentuate parts of the body. Uh, you know that we're not supposed to be finding our worth and our identity in how good-looking somebody thinks we are, and so we need to not be dressing in such a way as to try to uh, root our identity and our external appearance. You know all of those things, right? Uh, let's say this. You also know that we're supposed to be stirring one another up toward love and good deeds, that we're supposed to be holding one another accountable, that we're supposed to be pressing each other in the direction of Christ-likeness and holiness. You know both of those things. You also know a person who you're friends with, who you go to church with, who is maybe violating the biblical teaching on modesty to the best of your knowledge. Knowledge, right? You know it. You see them wear things, and you're just like, oh, I just, I, I don't know if that's really kind of what Jesus has in mind for you to be putting on your on your body. Like, I just don't, don't know if that's really honoring to Christ. That may be not great. You know that. But you also know that some things in the Christian life are a matter of freedom of conscience. You know those passages of Scripture, too, that... In, in some situations, you don't get to say, my understanding of what is and is not modest is binding upon you. Who gets to make those decisions? Who gets to make that call? So you think you know that they're not walking in such a way as to honor Christ with their dress. You also know that we're supposed to hold one another accountable and help each other become Christ-like and fill in blind spots for our brothers and sisters in the same way that they should do that for us. But you also know that sometimes you may have a personal understanding of something that is not a scriptural understanding of something, and maybe in those situations you shouldn't impose what you think on somebody else and try to bind, bind their conscience where scripture doesn't bind their conscience. And so it's like, do I say something to this person? Do I not say something to this person? You've got knowledge of some biblical passages over here and knowledge of some biblical passages over here. But how do you apply that knowledge in a wise way? Perhaps you need the Holy Spirit to give you the gift of wisdom. And so, often the Holy Spirit does that. And this is a much-needed gift in the church because we have lots of knowledge of biblical principles, but having the wisdom to apply that knowledge properly can be a separate thing entirely. So that's a little bit about the gift of wisdom. Next, we come to evangelism. Evangelism. You know, every Christian is called to do evangelism, share our faith, herald the gospel. Uh, King Jesus has called us out as ambassadors, and he's making his appeal to the world through us, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, but statistically, to our shame, most Christians don't share their faith. We just don't do it. Uh, but there are some people uh, who love to share their faith. There are some people who don't who don't have to plan it, who don't have to try to like get themselves revved up to do it. They don't need accountability partners to make sure that they've done it. Uh, some people are just naturally predisposed toward 
uh, sharing the gospel. And actually, now that I've used that language, I wouldn't say they're naturally predisposed. I'd say they're supernaturally gifted, because that's actually what we're talking about, spiritual gifts. There are some that the Holy Spirit has just wired that way upon their conversion. And it's just made it so that it's a joy, it's a delight, it's, it's a second nature truly second nature in that they've been given a new nature and part of that new nature is this impulse to do evangelism because it's a spiritual gift uh, whereas others of us it feels like it's, it's like okay I'll, I'll do it I'll do it but man I'm nervous oh man this is going to be clunky oh man this is probably going to be socially awkward and then there are others for whom that's not the case at all some of us really do sort of agonize over how am I going to get from, yes, I'd like a tall vanilla latte to if you died tonight or while you were making my latte, do you know where you'd spend eternity? Meanwhile, while we're agonizing over that in the Starbucks line, our friend who we came with is sitting at a stranger's table and he's in the middle of praying the prayer of salvation to receive the Lord Jesus. And you're like, how did that happen so fast? Maybe, maybe it's the gift of evangelism, you know, for some people. Uh, those things come easily because the Holy Spirit has gifted them to do it. So, the gift of evangelism. Pastor Shepherd. Uh, this is the last gift that we have to define. The Pastor Shepherd is someone who is an influential servant among God's people an influential servant. It's someone who uh, helps other people in their relationships with Jesus. Uh, it's somebody who helps with understanding the Bible. It's someone who helps with applying the Bible to people's lives. Uh, a shepherd, you know, that the word pastor is often translated shepherd. Those are uh, seemingly interchangeable terms in terms of what that function is. And it's someone who much like you could think about a shepherd tends sheep and helps them get to the place where they can drink water and helps to make sure that they don't walk off cliffs and helps to make sure that wolves don't come in and terrorize them. It's a very similar thing. And so the shepherd is, is one who generally just sort of has a, a kind of natural influence that people look to that person, people naturally kind of come to that person, people kind of naturally follow the person who has the pastor-shepherd gift. And they are not only gifted with influence in the church, they're also gifted uh, often with some measure of wisdom, often with some measure of teaching. Sometimes there are certain sets of gifts that come together uh, in order to fulfill other gifts. So, which is one of the reasons why we talked earlier about thinking categorically. So, uh, do that. Do think categorically, particularly with this gift, because think about it. Uh, you don't have to have the title pastor to have the spiritual gift of pastor-shepherd. Uh, this isn't a spiritual gift that is conferred only after graduation from Bible college or seminary. Uh, this is a gift that's conferred by the Holy Spirit. So don't get hung up on the language as it's currently used in modern American culture. Uh, you don't have to feel like, you know what, one day I think I'd like to be a preacher, uh, so I must have the gift of pastor and shepherd. You may have no aspiration toward that. You may not be called even to that role, uh, and yet you could have that spiritual gift. And so just think about it. Am I inclined toward discipleship relationships? Do people kind of naturally come to me, seek me out, ask me for counsel, uh, want me to provide clarity in this area of their lives, want to bounce things off of me? If that's the case, if you've got relationships like that, if you've got people seeking you out for that, or even perhaps if you have a strong desire to do that, then it could be that you've got the gift of Pastor Shepherd. So at this point, I'll leave you to your conversation, and I'm looking forward to next week.